So dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word and thank you for the confidence that your word gives us. Thank you for the joy it gives us and thank you that you have called us friends. And in so doing, you have shared your thoughts with us. So we pray that you bless the thoughts this evening in Jesus name, amen. So we're starting here on Leviticus 23. Um, I guess we've um, managed to get, get all this way. 23 is about the feasts. And this is just exciting, joyful chapter. It's something that has so much in it. And um, unlike some chapters that were sometimes a little rough to get through, uh, this should be just pure excitement. Um, I usually do one or two chapters at a setting. And right now, I think I'm going to only make about halfway through this chapter. There's so much in it. Chapter 23, it's about the feasts, the seven feasts. and um, you, know, you can take entire semesters on this chapter. So we'll go ahead and get started with this. Um, verse 1, chapter 23 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. We see the word even in King James. It means namely or it means uh, specifically. And God is saying, this, these are new things. Now, some of these things they've done or they have done in the past, but at this point, these seven events are supposed to be done on a regular annual basis. The word feast here is moed, and it really means appointed time. And it has an interesting meaning to it because in addition to appointed times, it also means... Um, kind of like time pointer. It is a future looking phrase. It means that these are events that are supposed to look forward or anticipate a special time. So they are pointing times. Um, the word sometimes means signal, a signal of something that's coming up in advance. Um, not warnings, but um, in preparation. Um, and it is definitely a festival. Um, feast is what happens at these things. They eat. Um, they're feasts. They're not fasting, and they're not funerals. Just a, a quip that I, I read. These are feasts. All but one are, are absolute celebrations. All seven of these are, are um, looking back. They're commemorations on a very special, specific thing that God did for the people. But because they are appointments, uh, pointing times, these festivals and these commemorations are supposed to be regarded as um, forward-looking events as well. In other words, God is saying, when you celebrate these things, think about them and use them to help look forward to the coming Messiah. Look forward to events that will happen. So they are also prophetic, and we'll be discussing how um, some of them have already come to pass. So we have seven. Um, Deuteronomy 16 commands that all males must go to Jerusalem to celebrate these seven feasts. No options. You got to be in Jerusalem. Doesn't matter where you are, you got to make a trip to Jerusalem if you're a male. Uh, the women are not left out because women are strongly encouraged, they're invited, they're asked to do whatever they can to make it, but they're not commanded. It's where God says that's a man's job to get there and do it. It's a woman's, woman's privilege, um, but God is also understanding that they may have other things that make it impossible to come. So, but men, they're not excluded. So we have four feasts that happen in the springtime. And the, the, the arrangement is really strange. As we start studying this, let's just think about how impossible it would be for a culture to generate these festivals on their own. These festivals are definitely ordained by God with very precise, specific purposes in mind. And the four feasts are in the springtime. There's a very large gap, a large waiting period, and then there is three more in the fall. 
And uh, as we look at these feasts as appointments or as prophetic indicators, we will see that these first four things were fully fulfilled by Jesus. Yes, they are commemorations, but as we study them, we'll see they point to Christ and see that Christ, Christ accomplished them. And the final three are things that Christ has yet to accomplish, Christ has yet to do, to fulfill. So, as I said, all but one are celebrations, festivals. So, we'll start reading here. It says, they concern the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are holy. Uh, they're not frivolous. They're not voluntary for men. They're not, um, although they're festivals, they're not parties in the sense of carefree, in the sense of you know, losing your mind. Um, we'll see how one of the festivals, sometime after the time of Christ, was, was adjusted to, to make sure that people didn't party too much. So <clears throat> these are my feasts specifically. Now before he announces the feast, he gives them a reminder. Verse 3, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Just a reminder to the people that just like the Sabbath is a holy convocation, it is a sacred time set aside. The Sabbath is one of the defining um, items of identity for the Jewish people. And he's saying that is serious. Don't violate that. Keep that <clears throat> very, very sacred. And he's reminding, he's letting them know that just as the Sabbath is absolutely holy and must not be violated, these upcoming feasts have the same type of weight and type of severity to them. So we keep the Sabbaths in all our dwellings. Verse 3, verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord. Even holy convocations. Again, that word even. But namely, the holy convocations are specifically He's drilling down the meaning there, and he's reminding them it's just as holy as Sabbaths, okay? And you shall proclaim these things in their seasons. When it's time to do this, you do it. These seasons are um, going to be um, going to be for posterity. And our first feast here, it says, in the 14th day of the first month at even or in the evening time, is the Lord's Passover. Passover. Um, each one of these is a commemoration and an expectation. The commemoration is, of course, the celebration of being set free from Israel. Um, they are set free from Egypt, which is the type of the world or type of sin. And <clears throat> what happened in, as we all know, in Passover, the blood of lamb was placed on the doorpost and the top and also in Exodus 12, 22, in the basin. At, at every door frame entering into a house, there is a small foot basin, a little basin of water. People would wash their feet in. And so on the night of Passover, we have blood on the top, on the two sides, and at the foot of the door in the basin, which, of course, outlines a cross for us. Um, this was a celebration for the Jewish people. It happened once, and God is now establishing that this must be celebrated every year on the 14th day of the first month. And this is the month of Nisan, which is the first month in the religious calendar. So on the 14th day, you celebrate Passover. The Passover involved taking the blood and putting on the doorpost and then eating the lamb. Um, and of course, the word Passover comes from the fact that God declared that the death angel was going to come and strike dead the firstborn of anybody, everything, even animals in Egypt. And if the death angel saw the blood, he was commanded to pass over that house. And of course, we can see the application. Um, 
uh, and Paul in 1 Corinthians lets us know Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the one who was executed, and his blood covers us from God's wrath. God's wrath goes on his son and not on us. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So in Egypt, while they were trapped in the world system and trapped in sin, they, after hundreds of years of enslavement, in one night, they're saved. In one event, they're saved. In one, one moment in time, the, <clears throat> the Egyptians are struck down with the final plague, where the firstborn is all, they're all killed by God, by the death angel. And as a result, the Egyptians demand that they leave. Get out of here. You may have noticed sometimes that when you are saved or you're functioning in the spirit, the world tells you to get out of here. You know, they don't want our kind sometimes. And as they were sent out, that event is now being commemorated. At the Last Supper, Jesus was performing or administering the Passover meal. He was in charge of it. And he let us know that his body and his blood were the Passover wine and the Passover lamb. Um, his shed blood allows God's judgment to pass over us. And then, of course, at Passover, they're commanded to eat the Passover lamb. So there's two aspects to Passover. One is apply the blood, eat the lamb. And applying the blood, um, people can study the New Testament and study the life of Christ and be impressed and amazed and moved even. And they may say, this is a great idea and I love the teachings of Christ, but unless you eat the lamb. And Jesus told us that application of the blood, assimilation of the lamb. So we take it personally. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body. Okay. Take and drink. This is my blood. So Passover happens on the 14th of Nisan, but on the 10th day, four days earlier, is when the lamb is selected. Now, the 10th day of Nisan is a Sunday, and there's different ways of looking at this. Uh, most practical way is the day, 10th of Nisan is what we would call Palm Sunday. On the 10th of Nisan, while all the Jewish people were out selecting their lamb, and they're going to select the lamb, they're going to take it home, they're going to watch it, they're going to care for it, the kids are going to fall in love with it. And then on the fourth day, on that evening, they have to take it into the priest to be killed on Passover on Friday. And so at the same time people are out selecting their lambs, the people of Israel are also praising Jesus and saying, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. They are picking Jesus as their Passover lamb. I'm not fully aware of it, but they're saying we're going to accept him. They later on reject him as king, but they have, they have selected him. And they later on select him by saying, crucify him. So on the 14th day, he's taken in twilight, the beginning of the 15th day. Uh, another interesting way to look at this, though, is the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And if we consider you know, our biblical worldview of a planet that is a little over 6,000 years old, that means that the lamb was selected, and 4,000 years later, he shows up. Four days later, there he is, right on schedule. And uh, so Jesus was selected on Palm Sunday taken to the priests on Thursday evening, inspected and killed on Passover. And he was being executed. He was, his nails are going into his body at the same time. Down the hill, back in the city, priests were starting to sacrifice their first lambs on Passover, right on that same time. And uh, that, of course, is one aspect of Passover. The other aspect of Passover, which we'll talk about later, is of course the um, 
the bread part. And I'm going to talk about that later as we go straight into the next feast. So verse 16, on the 15th day. So it's interesting, we got four feasts, but one starts on one day and the second one is the very next day. So the very next day, on the 15th day of the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. And this lasts for seven days. For seven days you eat unleavened bread. So this is commemoration, of course, because when they were, um, after Passover, in, in, during Passover, in the very first Passover, they were commanded to make unleavened bread. The stated practical reason was you're going to have to leave at a moment's notice, at a drop of a hat. You don't have time to let the bread rise. Unleavened bread, you get ready because you're going to have to have your coats on, unleavened bread, your shoes on in the house. And when the Egyptians say, get out, you get out. You're going to be heading out immediately. So as a commemoration here, you can imagine that... Um, uh, Jewish family is they're doing unleavened bread and the kids start asking why are we doing this and of course the answer is we're celebrating the fact that we made unleavened bread as we headed out of Egypt but leaven also is a it's a metaphor for sin throughout the Bible and unleavened bread stands for sinless bread or perfect bread and what often happens in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread is Jewish families will go through and make sure there's no leaven in the house. Nothing really wrong with leavened bread, but when you're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you don't want it around you. And of course, this leads to what we know as spring cleaning. So, and there's games that will play, they'll play with children. They'll hide pieces of, le of bread with leaven around the house. Kids have to go hunt for them. Parents make a, make note where they left them so that eventually they can go through and clean it all out. And sometimes in some Jewish communities, all the leaven would be gathered out and a little party would go outside in the lot nearby and burning all the leaven. And of course, again, the children would say, why are we doing this? And the commemoration is that well, we had to leave Egypt so fast, we couldn't wait for the dough to rise. We were commanded to have unleavened bread. And of course, we understand that as we leave Egypt in our own lives, we're asked to leave the world swiftly. As you know, when we, when we get saved, we leave the world behind. We spend the rest of our lives divorcing ourselves from the world, our old master, our old husband in a way. And we, we, um, <clears throat> we, we always move on, always looking forward. We want no leaven in our lives in that sense. So, but that, of course, is the, the celebration, the commemoration of a past event. This was required to last for seven days. So they're celebrating seven days of unleavened bread, seven days of perfection. Of course, Jesus came along and throughout the book of John declares he's the bread of life. Um, he compared himself to manna saying that the manna that Moses gave you didn't give you eternal life, but I do. And of course, everything in our Old Testament and the law in Leviticus, they're shadows of the real thing. So even in the Passover meal, Jesus took the leavened bread, the unleavened bread and said, this is my body. He is our unleavened bread. He is our bread of life. And um, of course, in the Passover, the Seder, there's some interesting things that happen with unleavened bread. Most people know what matzah is. This is unleavened bread. This is what's used in Passover and many other activities in the Jewish culture. But one of David's prophecies concerning the Messiah was that his body would not see corruption. Now let's get a fundamental principle from the Bible, and that is sin causes death. All throughout Leviticus, we've seen that example. Sin causes death. It might cause death by stoning, 
but it still causes death. It brings death. This is a result of sin. The New Testament confirms that the wages of sin is death. And so if Jesus is claiming to be, I'm going to put a little twist here. If he's claiming to be unleavened bread, and in the festival of unleavened bread, Jesus was killed as Passover, unleavened bread, if there's no sin, there should be no death. If the wages of sin is death, there shouldn't be death. But here Jesus has died. I often talk about at Easter time that the disciples were very discouraged and despairing because the man that told them that if you believe in me, you'll never die, has just died. And there can't be anything more despairing than that to their minds. They didn't understand the big picture at the time. So we have Jesus killed on Passover in the grave. And now we're celebrating seven days of um, unleavened bread. So I'm going to ask the question, was Jesus really as unleavened as he claimed to be? This is a heretical, blasphemous question, which we will have the proper response to soon. So matzah is striped and has holes in it. Just like the Bible says the Messiah is going to be striped by his stripes, we are healed. Psalm 22 talks about his piercings. Zechariah talks about the holes in his side. And we see that through the ages, the Jewish Passover has adopted many things that are extra biblical. But they're very strange because all of them point to the Messiah. And most Jews don't know why their matzah is striped and has holes in it. We can share that with them. Um, they have some attempts at explaining it that don't make a lot of sense. But I'm going to talk about a, a specific part of the Passover meal. And that is um, between the first and second cup. There's actually four cups in a Passover meal. Between the first and second cup, um, the person officiating it opens up a bag. And this bag has three pieces of unleavened bread, three pieces of matzah. And these three pieces are set out and they're given a show to the children. And this is a more modern thing, but they'll take the middle piece of matzah, they put them in side by side, one, two, and three, the middle one. They'll break it in half and they'll take the broken half and put it in a linen bag or a linen wrapping of some sort, just like the one Gay is showing there. And um, they'll Actually hide it. Pockets. Yeah, they'll hide it. There's a little pocket there. And they'll hide it, and the kids go out and try to find it. They go try to find the hidden, broken matzah. And eventually, when the kids finally find the hidden third piece, then they can continue on and to... Um, drink the third cup. And so you can ask someone, well, why do you break this matzah? Or what's the significance of it? And they generally won't have a good answer for it. One of the better answers, well, the three matzahs represent the prophets, the Levites, and the people. Which sounds pretty until you say, well, why do we break the Levites in half and hide them? Um, <clears throat> what happens here is that this broken piece is called uh, afikomen. Afikomen, and it's the only non-Hebrew word in Passover. Okay. Now, at some point um, in, in further back in history, be, uh, before the temple fell, they would not be breaking moths. They'd actually eating lamb at this point. They would eat lamb at this point. And, but after the temple fell, they started doing this instead. Um, what happened is after the temple fell, a lot of the rabbis started, they, they didn't, didn't want this celebration turn, turn into too much of a party. And there was a Greek word called epikomion, which was what the Greeks did after pagan celebrations. They would uh, go into big drunken parties and feasts after the pagan events and go from house to house. 
And so they said, we're not doing that. We want this ceremony to be somber and sincere. And so they started using epicomen instead, which is opposite. This is, uh, it, it kind of means that this has been accepted. But what's interesting is that the afikomen really means it, the idea is that it means he has come. He has come. There is a Greek word in Hebrews 10, we're quoting Psalm 40, I have come, talking about Christ has come. So I'm not going to say that the Jewish people chose the word afikomen to mean I have come because they had their own you know, practical reasons for it. But you can explain to a Jewish person that that second piece of matzah that you broke and hid and you put in linen and hid away and waited for the kids to show up to find and reveal to you is the one that says, I've already come. I'm, I'm already here. The Messiah is saying, I have come. I'm here. So I mentioned our four cups. There are four cups in a traditional older Passover. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. And this is referring to the Bible verse, I will bring you out from under the burden of Egypt, of the Egyptians. The cup of judgment, stop talking about delivering you from bondage. The third cup, so I will redeem you with the outstretched arm, with great judgments. Luke 22, Jesus, before he took this third cup, said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. So before Jesus drank the cup of redemption, he identified himself as the cup of redemption, saying, this is my blood. And then the fourth cup is typically, typically called the cup of praise. Um, some people try to call it wrath. It doesn't really fit. However, um, it is a statement that the fourth cup is when God declares that you have become my people. It is praise in the future for a time when the Jewish people will acknowledge their God and God will be able to say, you are now my people because you've chosen me. And of course, we see that at the end of the tribulation period. But what's interesting, in Matthew 26, 29, Jesus says, I will not drink from this cup. He, he, he makes a declaration that this fourth cup, the cup in which the Jewish people are fully reconciled to their Messiah, says, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So this is a prophecy that Christ made based on the Passover cup, saying that the final fulfillment of the overall of Passover would not happen until uh, the final kingdom comes, um, the day of the Lord from the Old Testament. So um, it's interesting that this afikomen is hidden, and then the kids find it and bring it out. So we gotta keep moving. Our next feast. Okay, the six, verse six was the unleavened bread, do no work. Uh, verse eight, we're finishing up with the unleavened bread. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. It's amazing. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. And so many of these celebrations were celebrations saying rest. Sometimes resting is the hardest thing for us to do. God tells us to rest, and sometimes we can't rest our mind. We can't rest. We can't always trust God like we're supposed to. So, verse 9, this is our next feast. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, When you have come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he says, and you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to accept it for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. 
So this is the feast of first fruits, and this applies when they enter into the land. So at some point they're going to start farming, at some point they're going to bring the agriculture. And this first fruit is a first fruit of barley. Barley and wheat, barley, barley comes first in the harvest, wheat comes a little bit later. Um, barley tends to signify outward perfection. It doesn't necessarily negative, it just means outward perfection. If you recall, when the lambs were brought in for inspection, they were inspected on the outside. They couldn't really be inspected on the inside, but they're inspected on the outside, no blemishes, no mark. And so this first fruit, what God is saying is that when you come into the land, if you give me your first fruits, I will continue to bless you. Your first fruits are to me, after that, all the grain that comes out, all the wealth, all the prosperity that will follow. <clears throat> God is also saying, when I accept the first fruits, I will then accept all the harvest that comes after that. So it says, you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted to you. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Verse 12, you shall offer that day when you wave it, the sheaf, wave the sheaf, a heathen without blemish, blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. So this is a special burnt offering. Burnt offerings happen after a sin offering has been accepted. Burnt offering, verse 13, and a meat offering thereof shall be two tenths of fine flour mingled with oil. Okay, let's stop there. This feast is a commemoration, but at the time Moses is giving it, it's a commemoration of something even for them that was future. Commemoration of when you go to, go to the land, you're going to have your own crops. When you have your first fruits, you're going to um, put me first. Now, the, this is what confused some people. The unleavened bread festival feast lasts for seven days. In the middle of that feast comes the, it says the morrow after the Sabbath. What's the day after the Sabbath? Well, it's Sunday. So on Sunday, in the middle of their um, unleavened bread feast, you have to also perform this first fruits feast. And the first fruits feast is on the Sunday in the middle of unleavened bread, and you're celebrating the first fruits, the first fruits that have come from the land, that come from God. <clears throat> so while the priests are out there waving their barley, Jesus has risen from the dead, same day. Priests are out there raising their barley, waving their barley, the first fruits. And Christ has always talked about how unless a seed die, it can't grow. So resurrection is always implicit when, when plants grow. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, every man in his own order, because Christ is the first fruits. Christ is the first fruits. Afterwards, and afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. The first fruits is saying that the Messiah is going to appear in, in a supernatural way. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the first fruit. And as such, Jesus Christ is the first human being ever to be resurrected from the dead. That is a blanket statement. And you're supposed to say, wait a minute, what about Lazarus and other people that were raised from the dead? And there's a big difference. Primarily, Lazarus and the people that Elijah raised from the dead and other people that were brought back from the dead, they were resuscitated. They weren't resurrected. Every one of those eventually died again. Every one of those were raised with a natural body. Jesus Christ is the first fruits because he was raised with a glorified body. He was raised with an eternal body. And he, as our first fruits, indicates that when we accept his Accept him, God accepted him, and we will also be like him. If the first fruits are accepted by God, then all the rest of the harvest is accepted by God. So, we had a question earlier <laughs> Was Jesus really unleavened? 
And the answer is yes. The wages of sin is death. My friend Donish that I do outreach with on Saturday, he likes t saying that, this picturing Jesus died, he goes into the tomb and he meets death and death says, excuse me, what are you doing here? He says, well, I was killed. And death says, but, but you don't have any sin on you. And death spits him out. The tomb says, you don't belong here. Get out of here. Um, the death is for sin. And Jesus was spit out. We know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof positive that the Father accepted what the Son did. We saw that as the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. When he comes out alive, we know, phew. God accepted what the high priest did. <clears throat> but our high priest, he went into the Holy of Holies, did his job, paid for the sins of the nation and the sins that were dumped upon him. <clears throat> and once that was accomplished, he was sent back. So on the Feast of First Fruits, our Messiah comes back from the dead, confirming he really is unleavened confirming he really is without sin, confirming that the sacrifice has been fully accepted and fully complete. So with that complete acceptance in mind, we now know that we are now fully accepted too. So let's put this together. Jesus sacrificed on Passover, buried at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, rose again on first fruits. Right on the exact day, on the exact time performing all the functions that were required of him jesus being both high priest and sacrifice <clears throat> so let's move on to our next our feast of weeks um and i'm not finished reading about this yet okay we have the the, the lamb offering meat offering Verse 14, this is continue on with the uh, first fruits. You shall neither eat bread nor parched corn nor green on the self same day you brought an offering to your God. This is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep or wave offerings, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So we're going to continue on now with our next feast it's called the Feast of Weeks because it is a feast that happens seven weeks, seven weeks after Passover. And <clears throat> so if you count seven Sabbaths, that's seven weeks. And of course, seven times seven is 49. And it says you start counting on the day after it. So you count 49 days and then the day after that. So if I start with Sabbath and I go for seven weeks, I end up on a Sabbath. And the day after that, add one day to get to get to day 50 is a Sunday. So, verse 17. You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenth deals. This should be a fine flour. This should be baked with leaven. These are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now, this is a shocking, shocking verse. God says to celebrate our feast of weeks. Our feast of the New Testament calls it Pentecost, which is simply the word Greek for 50th, as in 50th day, day 50. Um, you're going to make two loaves of bread, and you're going to make it with fine wheat. Not the barley, but fine wheat. Fine wheat is what you have to use um, in the temple. Um, there's no mention of myrrh here, but fine wheat still indicates holy. Okay, But we're mixing it with leaven. Now, the average Jew, when you read this at that time, would have been kind of disgusted by that. All along, leaven has got to be kept out. No leaven anywhere near the temple. No leaven on the day of unleavened, the week of unleavened bread. Leaven is always a sign for sin. Leaven is always a sign for corruption. And now suddenly, they're told to make two special loaves with leaven. <clears throat> And they're told in verse 7, these are the first fruits of the Lord. You go, wait a minute. We just celebrated first fruits. And the first fruits there was the barley that we brought out. But what happens between the first fruits and this festival or feast of weeks? 
Well, after the feast, feast of first fruits, everybody goes home. You go home because you have 50 days. You got seven weeks before it's time to go back to Jerusalem, especially if you're a male. You have seven weeks to go back. So everybody goes home. And they go back to their regular lives. But something happens later on, 50 days, and you have to run back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so the question is, what are we commemorating? What special event is 50 days after another special event? Well, the very, very first Passover was the night they left Egypt. Passover. The death angel came. The world told them to get out. They got out. They had their unleavened bread, which was ready, seven days worth, and they subsisted on that as they left out and were sent to the wilderness. Fifty days after Passover, Passover, they find themselves at Mount Sinai. <clears throat> Mount Sinai is where the law was given. We can't crunch the numbers exactly in the Bible, but it looks pretty close to the, the exact day that the Jewish people heard the voice of God from Mount Sinai. If you remember from Exodus, the first time anybody ever heard the Ten Commandments was when God spoke it to them. You see in the movie, Moses going up the mountain, getting the Ten Commandments written and coming down and being offended because they're all breaking the law, so he breaks the law too. Um, but remember, the first time they heard it, they heard God's voice. God's voice spoke from the top of the mountain, and it was such a terrifying, thunderous, with the sound of trumpets, that's key for later, that they said, we don't want to hear that voice again. It's too disturbing. It's, too, it, it's, it's, it's shaking us up. And that voice delivered the law. So the commemoration, our feast of weeks, is so when you're raising your young Jewish children, you say, well, Pentecost, or the feast of weeks, festival of weeks, I keep saying that. Festival of weeks is when we celebrate when the law came. We celebrate when God spoke to us from Mount Sinai. He spoke to us with fire and in a strange voice. <clears throat> And if you remember, when Moses came down with, with the written law, remember God spoke the law, then they all agreed to follow it, and then they commemorated it, and then they had the marriage, if you will, between God and Israel. And then Moses went up to get the written version. And when he came down, they had all, they were already stepping out on God. You just got married, you're at your honeymoon, and and Moses leaves for a few days, and you come back, and um, you're, you've stepped out on God. He comes back, and as a result of that horrible sin, the camp got divided, and 3,000 3, people were killed. 3,000 people died. So put that in your mind. The law came down with a powerful, strange voice, um, <clears throat> disturbed the people, and the end result, 3,000 people died. So let's get back to our, our loaves here. They are told to make two loaves with fine flour baked with leaven. What are those two loaves? What could they possibly be? And there are different attempts by the Jewish rabbis to try to explain that. They basically generally say, well, the two loaves are the law, the two tablets, right? And well, that's nice, except why is there leaven in the law? The law is perfect. Why would there be sin in the law? And in fact, we'll see a little hint here. It says, in addition to the leaven, you should offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish for the first year. Make one-year-old bullocks, two rams for burnt offering, drink offerings, and the sacrifice of one kid of goats for the sin offering. There's a lot of little sacrifices here commemorating what God did. And it says, and the priest shall wave them, verse 20, with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering for the Lord with the two lambs, to be holy unto the Lord for the priest. This is a statute. And verse 22 is our first clue. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when you reap. You shall not gather any gleanings of thy harvest. You shall leave them to the poor and to a stranger. I am the Lord your God. Um, 
This is our repeat from earlier on in Leviticus when God told people to leave corners uncultivated or un, um, un, uncultivated, yeah, uncollected for the poor. Um, 50 days after Passover is when Pentecost happened. Pentecost is when the church began. This is the beginning of the church age. Now, anyone that's studying these feasts, if you're a Jew and looking at the signs of the times, remember, Jesus blasted the Jews of his day for not being able to read the signs. He says, you know the signs for good and bad weather, but you don't know the signs of the coming of your Messiah. He cursed the fig tree because they represented Jews that didn't, didn't know the signs. God expects people to know their Bible. He expects people to know their prophecies. When the people didn't know the signs of his first coming, um, God expected it of him, and God expects that of us. We're expected to know it. It's no excuse to say, I didn't know, because God will say, I wrote you a letter. So what happens here is our two loaves are the church. You can look at it different ways, but the church, the Jew and the Gentile, create one new person, one new creation, a new holy race of human beings. Before this, there's two types of people in the world, a Jew and a Gentile. And a Gentile is anyone that's not Jewish. At Pentecost, that changed. Jews and Gentiles were all pulled into the church, the ecclesia. This didn't mean that you lost your national or ethnic identity, but it did mean you're no longer counted in that group because you are now part of a new third group. Um, <clears throat> so on Mount Sinai, fire and strange voices came down and 3,000 people died. The upper room when Pentecost first, ha first happened was an upper room on Mount, si Mount Z Zion. Mount Zion is a little hill just outside of Jerusalem, and this is where the upper room was. And out Mount, on Mount Zion, fire came down, the spirit came down, came down in tongues, and it came down on their heads. And they started speaking other languages, and they came out with strength and boldness, and everybody around them was dismayed and distraught. If you remember, they thought they were drunk, right? But what was the end result? The end result is that at the end of that day, 3,000 people got saved. If 3,000 people killed by the law, 3,000 people redeemed by, by Pentecost. The Jews and Gentiles, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.14 says, he is our peace. He hath made both one, talking about Jew and Gentile. That also applies to um, the peace between God and sinner. But in the context of Ephesians, talking about Jew and Gentile, because it says Jesus Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, let's get back to the leaven. Guess what? You can look at it two ways. In the church, made up of former Jews and Gentiles, there's sin, okay? We're not perfect yet. So on the Bible instead, matter of fact, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen says, there's going to be heresies among you. That's just the nature of it. We all live in Christ. We've been declared perfect. We've been declared fine wheat, if you will. We've been declared righteous. But the practical reality is there's sin there. That's one way of looking at the leaven. I prefer to look at the leaven as the leaven represents Gentiles. Leaven, the, the people don't like it, but I say riffraff. Those, those pagans, the, the ones that had no law, the ones that were just, um, you know, uncircumcised, they've been brought in to the promise. And on this one special event, Gentiles are part of God's festival. They are brought in, and the entire church age has been God reaching out to the Gentiles. Now, to wrap this section up, I want to point out that because we're going to stop in after this festival next week, we're going to go into the festivals or the feast. I keep saying that the feasts that Christ has yet to fulfill. Okay. We got three to go. 
and we'll be talking about them next week. So it's very exciting. But um, when Jews celebrate the festival of weeks, and they're conscious of the fact this is when the law was given, and they excited about it, for some strange reason, they always read the book of Ruth. And you've asked them, why do you read the book of Ruth? They will say, well, Ruth's a story about, well, there's a barley harvest and there's a wheat harvest in Ruth. And so it seems appropriate to talk about barley and wheat. Barley was in the, barley was in the first fruit celebration. And then our Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, wheat is the celebration. So you have a barley and a wheat and there's, there's meaning and symbology there in Ruth. But something very interesting about Ruth, and to wrap this up, let's turn to Ruth. I'm going to close up with this. Hopefully you can see that this Feast of Weeks is a celebration of, well, it, it's for the Jewish people, it was anticipation of the time at which God would share the message of his salvation to the Gentiles. Fulfillment of Isaiah, where the, the Gentiles would be reached. Remember when Simeon blessed the baby Jesus, he quoted the Isaiah servant song saying that this baby would be a light to the Gentiles. So when the Gentiles are brought in to God's plan, this is when the church starts. The church starts at Pentecost and it ends at the rapture. So, Book of Ruth. Let's turn to that, Ruth chapter 4. And since I didn't bookmark it ahead of time, you're going to give me a second. Right in the middle here, someplace. Ruth chapter 4. So, the story of Ruth in a nutshell, and I'm, I'm going to say it this way so you can apply it to the Jewish nation, okay? So you have a Jewish woman that leaves her homeland, and she's very, very discouraged and despondent, but in the process of being away from her homeland, she encounters a Gentile woman, and this Gentile woman is introduced to the Jewish woman's God. And this Gentile woman says, I want your God. The Gentile woman says, your God is so much better than my God, the gods of Moab, the gods of this world. Your God is the creator God. I want your God. And so the Gentile and the Jew go back together, back to Israel. So this Gentile woman now finds herself in the place that was taught about God, where she's learned about God. And then she goes, takes advantage of the gleaning rule that we read about here for the second time. This Gentile gleans and finds herself in the, in the field of Boaz. And Boaz, of course, is the one that redeems her. The one that had a claim over her before Boaz. We don't have his name, but we can make a clear picture that this Gentile woman who was owned by another, namely Satan of the world, is now purchased by Boaz. Boaz redeems her, and this is where we get the basis for the fact that Jesus Christ had to be 100% human, because only someone who's 100% human could redeem a member of the human family. Otherwise, he would be an outsider. You know, Jesus as a human could not redeem dogs. Jesus has to be 100% human for that purpose. So the Boaz, the Redeemer, and the Gentile woman have a child. And we've seen this picture before. We see it in Revelation where God and Israel have a child, right? And, of course, the story of um, Joseph as a type of Christ is there. But in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13, And so what has happened is, okay, I keep talking, one, one more idea here. The, the Jew and Gentile, they go back, they survive by gleaning, and they have a baby. Now the baby's name we know is Obed, who's the father of 
Jesse, who's the father of Jesus, who's the ancestor, father of David, who's the ancestor of Jesus. So you have this direct lineage here. So remember, Jesus told the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. So let's look at this. Verse 14, verse 13. So, so Bo Boaz took Ruth. She was his wife. When he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. So Ruth had a son. This is a son, and in our typology, we'll say this son is the message of salvation. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who hath not left you this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Remember, the kinsman redeemer covenant, a requirement was, uh, if I have to go and marry my sister-in-law because my brother died, I'm agreeing to do that, but I have to agree that whatever child is born among us takes on the name of my brother. I give up all my parental rights because I'm honoring my brother. So in this case, Boaz took on the child. He agreed to it, but the child became the property and lineage of Naomi and Naomi's husband, the grandfather and the father. Which would, have been, which would have been Ruth's husband, but he had died as well. So there's an important reason to this. It says, they're praising Naomi. They say, Naomi, praise God, you're not barren after all. Praise God, you had a baby. And you go, wait a minute, I thought Ruth had the baby. No, no, Naomi, it's Naomi's baby. In verse 15, they're praising what he did. He shall be to you a restorer of your life, a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loved you, which is better to thee than seven sons has borne him. So they're praising the daughter-in-law because she gave Naomi a son. Doesn't sound quite right. But I want you to notice, it says Naomi took the child, put it in her bosom, and became a nurse unto it. We don't know what happened, but for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit removes Ruth from the story at this point. She disappears. She has, as a Gentile, has received the gospel. She has received the, 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 the salvation. And at some point, salvation returns back to the Jews. Notice here it says, and the woman, her neighbors gave it a name saying, this is the son born of Naomi. Wait a minute, where's Ruth? And they called him Obed. He's the father of David. And then we talked about Perez and it has the list of generations there pointing out how it overcame the curse of Perez and all that. But to, to wrap this idea up, our, <clears throat> our Feast of Weeks is 50 days after Passover, the law came. 50 days after Passover again. 50 days after Passover, God again spoke. He started the church age. With Passover, he will end the church age with the trumpet of the Lord. Trumpet of the Lord is mentioned twice in the Bible. Once in Mount Sinai when the law is given, and once at the rapture. So, what we see here is a picture of salvation comes to the Gentiles. But when the Gentiles disappear, and one of the jobs as a Gentile believer is to make the Jew jealous. If that's what Paul says, make them jealous. Say, we have the spirit, we have the joy, we have the freedom, and we don't have your, uh, we don't have your annoying law, but we're, we still have joy, and don't you wish you had this? At some point, the church will disappear. And this is when the Jewish people will, because of all these feasts, and start to realize they'll be, they'll be, they'll be forced back to their Bible forced back to take into consideration all the things that have happened in this past 2,000 years. And the, the, the message of salvation, the gospel, the person of Jesus Christ will end up back in among the Jewish people, taken in by Naomi to be loved and, nur and, and, and nourished, okay? Uh, the first time Joseph, the first time Joseph's brother showed up, they rejected him, right? Joseph said, hey, I'm here to help you. They rejected him. The second time all the brothers met Joseph, he revealed himself and they accepted him. Okay? That's a principle. First time Moses said, here, I'm going to save you, and he killed the Egyptian. 
um, they rejected him. The second time he showed up, they accepted him. The first time Jesus showed up, they rejected him. The second time Jesus shows up, he's going to reveal himself. They're going to know who they're looking at. They're going to look on the one whom they pierced, which we read about today. They're going to look at the one that they um, <clears throat> ignored. They're going to look at the one that um, <clears throat> they, re they refused to acknowledge that he fulfilled these first four feasts. And when they look at him, we're going to be looking at those final three feasts next week. And we're going to see how Jesus will fulfill those things and uh, complete bringing in Israel. Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. We know that there is a point in the future when Christ comes again, when the nation of Israel says, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. When they recognize that Jesus was, has always been their Messiah, they will call him, he will come, and in one day he will save them physically, militarily, and spiritually. So we will have our final feasts for next week. And let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. We thank you that um, you've sh chosen to share these things with us. Help us to meditate on these things. And as we go into our Christmas season, to think about your first advent. Let us put all these things into perspective. Your advent meant nothing without your successful mission at the cross. And will be completed at your second arrival, your second advent. So God, we pray you bless us at this time. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You brought out two or three things I hadn't heard before. How exciting. Wow. Thank you. Wow. I didn't expect that. That's a blessing. Uh, well, I've never seen Refuse the first time chosen the second time before that's beautiful mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a it's a pattern you, you can't call it a prophecy per se but you can definitely call it a, a pattern a yeah tendency. Uh -huh. <laughs> and of Thank course we so know much. that that will become true later on amen i think the one thing that was new to me was the last section in ruth that was something as I was putting things together, gave me one one final little kick of excitement. That was like a little new nugget. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Things. So, John. Yes, sir. Your studies that you've been giving us has made a whole new understanding of the, of the Christmas story and the that we're just studying in our Sunday school class. And it's giving me whole new things and ideas and thoughts as I share in Sunday school. Wow. Well, can't can't have a much of a higher commendation than that. When I when I taught hermeneutics in the Bible college, when students said, "Now I want to go read the Bible on my own. I didn't want to before." I said, "What, what more can you ask for, right?" And, oh, I think I want to study the Bible now. I did. I, it was boring beforehand, you know. So that's always exciting. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. I had fun watching Gay tonight. Yo, yeah. She was just full of smiles, and you could just see her excitement. That that was such a joy to watch you, Gay. Well, <laughs> it it is so amazing how they go together. You know, mm -hmm. it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. It's so exciting. Mm. Yeah. I just can't get enough. I can't. My brain's getting too slow, though. It messes <laughs> me up. Okay, so you can, there's entire semesters on this subject, but uh, um, uh, to get these, and of course, we're studying these things not for intellectual stimulation or uh, to glorify Christ as it does, but also we want to be able to share with others. If I say, hey, everybody, Jesus loves you. And you say, what do you mean? I say, well, the Bible says that Jesus came and died on the cross. And they say, I don't care about the Bible. Why do you believe the Bible? And I say, well, um, my pastor said it was true. It's not going to cut it. 
I gotta <laughs> have my hands wrapped around something. My brain has to be around something. If I can't show them Daniel or Leviticus 23 or give them some, you know, you know, the model we have is the message that Paul gave at Mars Hill for a for a biblically illiterate culture, which ours is becoming more and more. We have to start from the beginning. Let's present proofs for God. Let's get people understanding that there's, uh, you know, there's um, acknowledgments. There is uh, requirements, perhaps, of God, if there is a God. And when you start looking at these prophecies or how things tie together, the goal here is to make a person say, well, maybe that Bible is more than just a bunch of tribal legends or more than a bunch of primitive writings. Maybe there, maybe I should look into it a little bit more. You're not going to get a long ways right off the bat, but you get someone intrigued in the Bible and let God do his work, let the word do its work. Um, that's, that's really the reason we study this. I have to be able to have an answer for people. May I share briefly what happened to me on the night of Passover Absolutely. in 1963? I, I had not gone into labor and I was induced to have my fourth child on the first night of Passover, which was Good Friday, coincidentally. And my little Passover lamb was born at a 111 in the morning and I named her Jessica, which is the feminine form of Jesus. And it was mm -hmm. through her death that I came to know Jesus. But she was my Passover lamb. Can you imagine? God gave me that lamb to bring me to him. Wow. Isn't that a story? Uh, yeah. You caught me by the oh, guard there. My God. <laughs> There's a scripture that said it happened at midnight, too. And to have her induced at midnight was very special. So Passover, particularly when it comes together with um, Good Friday and Easter, is always miraculous to me. Yeah. I came home on Easter Sunday. Uh-huh. What a story, huh? Wow, yeah. That just proves that God always has a witness and a way to meet people very personally. Yes, so Passover is very special to me. God always orchestrates things to bring things home to us. He, there are no coincidences with God. Boy. Mm. Uh. Wow, yeah. You blindsided me there, Gay. I started to cry. Don't do that to me. Oh, no, no. well, it was so special. Mm. Oh, that was a Passover lamb if I ever got one. Mm -hmm. And I love the three matzahs and the matzah tosh. That's so funny that you take the middle one out, break it in half, hide half of it, unbury it, and wonder why it's the middle matzah. Isn't that funny? I yeah. think that had to have put in, been put in by the Greeks after, after the turn of the centuries because it really, it really um, is Jesus. That, that middle Passover, that middle matzah. Oh, yeah, no question. But it's interesting, even as the Jewish people developed Passover on their own, everything they did still points to Christ. Uh -huh. Christ still had control of it. They may have had their own religious or cultural reasons for doing it. But, I mean, explain to me why you stripe and punch holes in matzah. Yep. You know, the Bible doesn't tell you. you know what they, the Bible they does it. talk about holes in matzah. But it's, it's um after effect of how it's prepared. They say it's to keep the bubbles of air out of it. Oh, I'm sure there's a practical reason. Yeah, they have some good reasons. John, I, I see that middle loaf that's been broken and that as Christ was broken for us. Uh -huh. And the fact that they hide it. He was in the tomb, and they bring him out again. Uh -huh. Yeah, they yeah. bury it. Uh huh. But and you, you realize have to you have to give up your life to receive him, don't you? you it was Christ. Him. It was Christ who was breaking uh -huh. that so He said, "This is my body." Uh -huh. yes. uh -huh. In the actual Passover that he was yes. seeing. Yep. Boy, when I told when I was saved and told my kids that, you should have seen their faces. <laughs> oh dear. I'm so blessed. Well, thank you, thank you. This is my one of my favorite lessons. Uh, Listen, John, I want your address so I can email it to me so I can send you that uh, Messianic Times. I definitely will do that. I'll do that tonight. Uh, I'll Thanks. email it to you. You're wonderful. Thank you all so much. <sighs> so, <laughs> yeah, this, this chapter is a lot more exciting than some of the other chapters. <laughs> a lot more easier to speak on, to be honest, but 
um, this is this is the message of that God has for the for humanity. This is the big picture. One more places in the Bible where you can see the plan for the ages. It's jaw dropping. It really is. It really is. And I think this is thousands of years of planning. It's just miraculous. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, so blessed. John? Yes, yes, Mom. A little different uh, subject. When you were talking about the uh, at the beginning there with uh, the blood, you know, the wine and the blood, and you kept talking about eating the lamb, Mm -hmm. And it's always my body that was broken for you. And I'm a little bit confused. Well, eat, and, eat, uh, eat the bread and the body, not meat, not meat and juice, but bread and juice. Right. Um, like I said, the lamb got replaced by the matzah later on. But Jesus was being consistent because he always said, I'm the bread of life. Eat me. Yeah. talked about him being manna. And the first fruits is is wheat, is barley. The first fruits. That's bread. It's bread. So, so where did the lamb come in there? Well, it came in from the original Passover. They had to eat. Um, and the, the application there is, no matter how much you believe, you still have to apply it to yourself personally by eating. But the Passover lamb, eat my body, in that sense, was the lamb. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably at a loss to make a direct correlation between lamb and bread. Could, could I make yeah, a comment? They both I, apply it in the same way. Could I, that, I make a suggestion? Take a think about it. When Jesus made that uh, invitation at the Last Supper, he was making a change, and he's making it as a metaphor, possibly, and he held up the matzah, this is my body given for you, eat it. So he was making a trans transition so we don't have to eat the meat with the bread. And That's very possible. It is the the wine said, this is my, my blood. My blood, a too. Testament. It um, it's a confirmation of my New Testament, my new covenant. We're not drinking his blood either when we take the wine or the drink. Yeah. I think it's also correlation, too, is the original Passover. They were, they were instructed to slaughter the lamb, put the mm -hmm. blood on the, the post on there, and then eat the lamb on there. And that's it, the firstborn. Of course, Jesus was the firstborn as well. Well, another thing to point out is that sacrificing lambs after Christ's sacrifice is superfluous and actually forbidden. We don't sacrifice the lamb over exactly. again. It's offensive to sacrifice the lamb now that the real one's been sacrificed. Exactly. And he was okay. referring to him as being the new lamb. That's where the, this is my body. I am the lamb of God. Okay. Yep. That's another good way of looking at that. We do know, and it, it causes a lot of consternation to some theologians that in the millennial reign, they're going to reinstitute lamb sacrifice again as a commemoration of what Christ did. But there's no way in the millennial reign people are going to confuse that for the lamb actually bringing about forgiveness. Whereas in the Jewish mind, they equated that with forgiveness. Hebrews tells us that sacrificing lambs never did anything, but God honored it as an act of faith. But he can't honor that as an act of faith anymore. And Hebrews is very clear also that you do that again. Remember, the writer of Hebrews is telling Jewish Christians who are going back to Judaism saying that, you go back and sacrifice Jesus all over again when you do that. It's very right. offensive. But what happens to the bread of life then? We eat it. And it gives us eternal life. So we should have three. Bread of life, the uh, fruit of the vine, which represents the blood. Mm -hmm. That would take care of the lamb. Right. The point is that we don't eat, we don't sacrifice lambs anymore. So... We don't so the have lamb that. was slain. So, so the lamb and the blood Master time, you shouldn't. go together, even though it's That's supposed right. to be the fruit of the yeah. Lamb. Yeah. The last lamb of God, he was the last sacrifice. Yeah. We have That's what he's referring to the bread 
as well. Let's go back to the original Levitical things. Yeah, let's go back to the original Levitical things. We had blood and oil all throughout the Levitical things. The blood is applied first, and then the whole oil comes next. Next, we we apply the blood. We accept the blood. We take its application and its propitiation. And after that happens, we are now free to enjoy fellowship and communion. Fellowship is with bread. Fellowship is with a meal offering, which is bread. And fellowship is Jesus Christ saying, I'm the bread of life. You must eat me. So blood and bread. Blood is what clears the path for us to have fellowship. Bread is the actual fellowship. So that's the, the, the thought for the moment anyway. We get that cleared up now? <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I just was confusing. He says he must, everybody must eat the lamb. And everybody did eat the lamb on the first right. Passover. Yeah. But exactly. uh, he, was, he was bringing in, well, the first, they call it the Lord's Supper, actually. He was, mm -hmm. he was saying, eat me. I would represent, yeah. represent the whole, when Jesus did that, what we call the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, all he's doing is saying, Oh, you've been doing Passover all along. Let me explain it to right. you. Let me tell you what it's really, what it has always been you, about. Right. It's always been about me. So that's where, you know, this is my body. This is my blood. I, he never said anything about the lamb. Right. At the Passover. Yeah. But of course, that's who he was. So. Right. Woo. So we will um, dive into crazy stuff for for next week finish out the chapter i just as i was preparing this i said i can't slam this into one one night so well, i'd rather take it slower and so uh, do yeah. The yeah it's not a race so any last thoughts judy as she's smiling well okay well <laughs> so how did it become the lord's supper or the last supper and we just never transition and celebrate the Passover and commemorate what Christ did. I'd say at some point, that's just a very sad question. I don't know if we're supposed to do all those things. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, unfortunately, the church co-opted a lot of these things and turned them into things that were too mystical or religious on their own, on their own sake. You know, transubstantiation quite frankly, is as offensive as sacrificing Christ all over again, which Hebrews warns about. Um, I'm not going to, you know, sit down and start attacking other views of things. But um, I guess one of the problems is we just simply read the simple verses in the New Testament and don't study them out. And so we have communion like every third Sunday or, you know, so many times a year. And we do, you know, the wine, the wine and the bread, and we do what we're supposed to do. I mean, it is a sacrament. It's something that should be taken seriously. People in the early church died because they didn't take it seriously. You know, they turned it into a feast or a party. They're getting drunk or different things. So, yeah. so in the book of Acts, they actually celebrated that, I guess what you call a communion, from house to house. They broke bread together. Did I get that right? Yeah, just... they would. They would do that in house churches. They would do that wherever they met, got together. Um, a lot of that significance would disappear as it became more and more Gentile. You know, that's that's inevitable. That's what Rip Rap did to it. <laughs> so, because they were appointed feasts, actually, of course, instituted by God. So we just didn't transition over to the church. Yeah. And of course, we're not, the church doesn't, there's no requirement to celebrate any of these things. It was Jesus that told the church to celebrate communion and with the new emphasis, which we do. It's just, it can mean a lot more when you start seeing where it came from and the, the, the depths of the emphasis there, the different cups. And of course, we don't know all the details of how Passover was celebrated back then, too. We have modern Passovers and Passovers of the past few hundred years. So the instructions for Passover in the Bible are not very detailed either. You know? I 
when Jesus actually said he wouldn't drink the, I guess the last cup, I think there were four cups or something mm -hmm. uh, during the Passover feast. Or... Yeah, and again, that's a probable speculation. You can't say that's what the Bible says because it doesn't. Right, okay. Um, we, can, we can find meaning there and we can see, you know, when you see correct doctrine or something like that, I have no problem incorporating it and enjoying it and realizing that God allowed it, you know. God allowed this Afikoman to appear out of somewhere and become part of the system. And um, it, it does point to him. So, so praise the Lord. I was reading, you know, when they have the Afikoman and actually they break the, the masa and put it in the, I guess, in the middle compartment of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I call it pillow. <laughs> and when the child goes to find it, then the father will redeem it. With right. Maybe a, yes. So, yeah. I think it's part of the. Excellent. Yeah, this is this is absolutely exciting, and in some ways, you go, I can't get enough of this. Hmm. <laughs> Amen, John. Hmm. Amen. Oh, <laughs> I think we all feel that, that way when we start studying the Bible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. At some point, we have to say, "Thank God, we have all eternity." We might begin to understand at that time, huh? <laughs> well, we have eternity to get acquainted with God. No, that we, too. You know, yes. we have eternity to get acquainted with eternity. So. Well, um, let's go ahead and close up. Uh, I want to, Stuart, I haven't heard much from you. You want to just, um, if you have a comment, if not, just close in prayer for us. Well, my only comment had to do with Ruth, but um, it, it's from a, from the Mennonite tradition. You know, when, when Ruth disappeared, it, it really was from a Mennonite tradition, the fact that Naomi had lost all of her sons, and, and we were always taught that, that, uh, Ruth's son became Naomi's son, redeeming the family versus Ruth's son, redeeming her husband. And so Ruth and Boaz then became their own family unit. And that's why she's not mentioned again. That was the truth that came from our, my growing up. So it was a little different than what you said, but it, you well, actually, I was trying to say that I fully agree with what you just said. I was making the application beyond that, which is a tiny stretch, but I think it's applicable. And I, and I hadn't thought of it in that context. But Ruth is in the genealogy, one of the genealogies. That's what I was going to say. She's still in the genealogy. Absolutely. They don't talk about her because the Bible didn't talk about women for that very often. It names she, her she she one is of the as the mother. She's one of, one of a couple of Gentiles, Ruth and that, Rachel. Yeah, the genealogy was not what I was getting at. No, I know. So, near the end and, of the book you, of Ruth, when it finishes the book of Ruth and she stops being talked about, it's because her son was actually Naomi's son by 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 the redeeming process, right. not her own husband's redeemed son. That's the way we were taught too, and uh, that was evangelical uh, in my case. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Stewart. That's. Excellent. I didn't get any of that in my Lutheran background, so feel, you didn't. Feel bad. no, not from that standpoint. Oh no. yeah, well, that's why no, we get it, doctrine. What from, Stuart says is what we always. Say. That's why we get doctrine from Menno Simmons, not Martin Luther. Okay. Right. Well, Luther maybe that's. Maybe. Go ahead, Stuart. You want to close in prayer? Thanks. Yeah, Lord, I want to thank you for bringing these festivals to our our uh, our feasts to our minds and showing the fulfillment of you through them and how you fulfilled these first ones. And I look forward to the opportunity to see the ones next week that we are looking forward to your future return. In thy name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thanks so much. Wow. Thank, you. Wonderful. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, girl. Good night. You see you Saturday. Okay. Uh, John, before you turn it off. Okay. Is Philip still there? Yeah.
I, we sent a package to you today, and you're supposed to open it right away rather than wait. Okay. If it's moving, I'll open it. <laughs> Whatever it is. Okay. She sent me a puppy. Okay. <laughs> you better open it so I can be fed. <laughs> okay. That's what I thought. Okay. okay. You bet. Thanks so much, everybody. See you all. Good night. Good night, Good night. everyone. See you, Lester. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.